Wow, I'm really, really overwhelmed and thrilled to see all of you here on this beautiful sunny spring day in the Hamptons. Wayne is definitely our friend. I'm Terry Sultan, I'm the director of the Parish Art Museum, and this is a very exciting launch of our new collaboration with Take Two, the Hamptons Documentary Film Festival. We're very much looking forward to an ongoing and equally audience attractive program. We are working very hard to bring everyone together, to share ideas, to think, to change, to transform. And that is what we believe here at the Parish Art Museum, that arts in all media can change people's lives. Now I want to say a little bit of something about this film and the whole topic uh, before I introduce Jackie, which is that Robert Caro's book on Robert Moses was one of the first books on social history that I ever read. Out of college, I read it not too long after I graduated as an art major from Syracuse University, and I was absolutely riveted by the whole story of how one person with an idea for the good or the ill can actually change the whole course of the way people interact with their environment. So for me, it is a thrill to be able to host this documentary film so that I can now, after all of these years, and I won't tell you how many, can get the other side of this story. Every story has more than one side, right? And the question is, how do you learn about all of this and then make your own informed judgments about what's right and what's not right? That is why we have art. That is why we have documentary filmmakers. That is why we have novelists. That's why we have writers. That's why we have anybody. And it is our goal here at the parish to make sure that everyone can weigh in and that everyone has a voice. So I'm thrilled that you're here and I'm thrilled to be able to host this film and I'm super thrilled to introduce Jackie LaFaro who is the founding director of the Hamptons Take Two Documentary Film Festival and a great friend for at least nine years. So welcome and thank you so much. Thank you all. I'm equally uh, thrilled to see, see you all here to see this great film. Uh, I have a far less intellectual understanding of Jane Jacobs, but to say that I was born and raised in Greenwich Village. And for many of my days, particularly summer days, um, we would go to the, we called Washington Square Park the Big Park as opposed to the Little Park, which was the Sheridan Square Park. And many times I dipped my toes into that, what was then a fountain in the middle. And um, I can hardly imagine what Jane Jacobs and the West Village felt like when Robert Moses wanted to put a major throughway through Washington Square Arch, straight through the park, so that he could extend Fifth Avenue and call the real estate on the other side uh, Fifth Avenue South. You know, we've seen that. <laughs> so, um, so that's my context for the film. Uh, and you'll, you've probably read a great deal. Anne Searchin did a brilliant article in the paper on Jane Jacobs, and she's here. But um, I just wanted to give, give you a very brief uh, bit about Matt Turner, the filmmaker. <clears throat> and he conceived of this film about five years ago, right after he uh, debuted his film, Valentino, uh, The Last Emperor. How many of you saw that documentary? OK, great, great film. And he um, befriended, met, uh, Robert Hammond, who is one of the founders of the Friends of the High Line in New York City, which is one of the most brilliant repurposes of urban architecture that we can ever imagine. 
And they were in Rome talking, and they both had a passion for Jane Jacobs' book, The Life and Death of a City. And they said, you know, there's never been a great documentary film made about Jane Jacobs. Let's do it. And so then and there, uh, Robert Hammond signed on to, as a producer to this film, and it was born. They shot in China, in India, in New York. They interviewed a host of people, including um, Koch, who also sort of made his debut uh, trying to save the village. So uh, he can, uh, Tiernauer, the filmmaker, a wonderful documentarian, um, continues to write. He was a journalist at first. He writes for Vanity Fair, contributing editor. He is working, now this is his second film, and he's working on a couple more, uh, one on Studio 54 and what that life and culture was about. And so that should be very interesting. Um, so please join us after the film because there's going to be an inspiring conversation and, um, and, and you don't want to miss that. So just one note, if you can all turn off your cell phones, that would be great. And now it's time to celebrate Jane Jacobs, who understands the city from the bottom up. Thank you. This, this film, you know, obviously covers a vast, complicated, and now by many of us, pretty well understood. Hello? Is it on now? Uh, by many of us now understood gigantic and significant controversy. Uh, it covers it very well in a lot of its aspects. What I wanted to say is that it's totally relevant to us right now, even here, because we're confronted with many serious planning and long-term development issues that this film indirectly touches on, because it's about a city issue. But in our territory, in a very fast-growing neck of the woods, really fast growing under pressures that have to do with uh, centralized governments in various communities that aren't aware of maybe many of the things here, have to do with financial pressures that this touches on and that are pressing on our communities, environmental issues that are gigantic and that are offshoots of overdevelopment and increased density. Uh, this film shows the power of advocacy. And it shows the power of individuals, individual, separate, non-governmental people with guts and with a point of view that's justified. And two huge messages that are for us here, I believe, is you must be active and you must get together in your activity. You can't do it just as a letter writer to the press or something have to try to form communities of like-minded people and have the courage to confront uh, when you know that something's going the wrong way. And out of all the complexities in this film, which have to do with the cities around the world, we really have that message that needs to be taken right here to our territory uh, to preserve it and to make it grow correctly. So before questions, I wanted to kind of bring that up and make it clear that in my view anyway, <clears throat> this isn't just about a bunch of problems that happened in the past in big, big cities. It's relevant to us right here and to many other communities under huge pressure because they're so desirable. Uh, we could talk about so many aspects of what this film's about, but uh, sort of wanted to say that to all of us here. Um, I would uh, second that, um, not just because of where you are, but it's true of every local community across the country and in many places around the world. We're going through a very interesting period that threatens everything, and that's the financial pressures of the you know, uh, increased um, uh, incomes at the top, putting pressure on the bottom, and there are a lot of places around this country and around the world where low-income communities are still being wiped out in order to build new, not necessarily high-rise, but 
new middle and upper income communities or for uh, malls or for stadiums or whatever. <laughs> this is not the past. This is very much the present. And I think it is a mistake to interpret it as what happened. What is so discouraging to me, who has also been writing about these issues for so many years um, and talked at great length about these things with Jane, is that as much as her ideas have uh, you know, caught um, the public and, and in agreement, it's not at the top. There are many uh, officials and planners and designers who would tell you they are trying to design a la Jane Jacobs. But you have to look at that very carefully because what does it mean? What are they tearing down? What are they replacing? And how are they doing it? So uh, as Paul Goldberger says at, at the end, one of Jane's best traits was to be skeptical. And I think she would say to all of you, be skeptical from day one and stand up for what you observe to be the right thing. Well, and, and one other thing I'd say that's a takeaway, but it's not obvious in the film, is many of the issues that are um, underlying some of the actions that are dealt with and what can are confronted are issues of density. And the way density is handled, whether it's handled in a congenial way that's useful, <coughs> comfortable, safe, and so forth, is sort of the Jane Jacobs model. The way density is handled in a much higher density at larger buildings uh, is the model that has failed because it doesn't work for people very well. I notice in the communities here, we're confronting density issues all the time, upzoning of various kinds, uh, the threats of sewage treatment plants, which will allow then a much, much greater density to be built wherever those lines are, are created. And of course, we had our own highway questions, and they may not be over. They were finally the increased scale of the Long Island Expressway got defeated here at around the time some of this was going on. But the, the other side of permitting the uncontrolled dependence and use of the car is that the pressure for public transportation is diminished or less forceful. And we may be at an inflection point here where advocacy for more kinds of public transportation that's sound and safe to confront our automobile problems is, is coming along. It may be not yet, but it probably will happen. And then there's the whole business, and don't get me started on the airport. Because <laughs> <laughs> you probably know a little bit about how I feel about the airport. Uh, the noise intrusion, because a few people right at the top, as Roberta said, feel privileged to destroy the, the calm and peaceful environment we live in minus one percent, half of a tenth of one percent, is a issue that's affecting the environment we all live in here. It's another mode of transportation that's only going to become much more powerful. I don't know if you've seen that Blade has now got a deal with Delta Airlines where you can get a, a, a helicopter right from the airport out wherever you want to go with your martini and everything. So it's the next level, the next mode of transportation that can uh, affect negatively huge <coughs> percentages of the population. And again, an advocacy issue may be brewing of a really major scale. Well, there was a street trolleys that ran through the entire region that is now highway, jammed up highways in Los Angeles. And many other cities, we had a national network of rail and trolleys that link. You could go from, I believe, New York to Boston, almost to Maine, on rail, on local rail trolleys. On a pocket full of town to town. And uh, the, the, the urban issue that he, that's raised in this film about <laughs> highways also is a national issue of the destruction of a public transportation system. And unless we're willing to endure uh, <coughs> 
crowd, crowded roads and objectionable conditions on the highways, we're not going to get the pressure for returning transit, which is very hard, complicated, expensive to do. But looking long term, it's probably going to happen. Also, if you... Yeah, let's, let's get another question. Uh, but I want to add oh, to that. Okay. In Jane's last book, Dark Age Ahead, she goes into some detail on the conspiracy uh, among General Motors, uh, U.S. Steel, uh, Firestone Rubber, and the group of them to take out the streetcars and replace them with rubber tire buses. And that was the beginning of the end of what was in the world yeah. the best uh, streetcar and uh, rail system anywhere. Which city in the country is doing the best job? None. I would say that there are areas of different cities where there is an active local um, you know, uh, involved community that are resisting in a way and coming out with better results. But there's no one city that you can point to uh, that has it right because the you know, as someone said, asked after one of the showings, when will we ever learn that top-down doesn't work? And that has not been learned in any city. In some places, bottom-up has, you know, done the kind of struggling work that, that Jane and the village did um, and have succeeded. Um, but it's tough. Money talks. Well, yes, that's, that's the part, the, the financial underpinning of these projects and the pressure that's unrelenting because of profitability is something, again, skepticism is very necessary and awareness of the economics un, uh, under many of these forces. And that's very hard to counter. The airport's another example of this, the amount of money being poured into propaganda and to, to help increase the amount of air traffic and types of airplanes and avoid any local control is enormous. It may go to the Supreme Court, as some of you know. What do you think has been lost in terms of the communities out here by the fact that fewer and fewer people of modest means can afford to live here? Well, I think, I think a lot's been lost, and I think it's one of the toughest problems in planning uh, and community management. I've confronted it in Aspen here, other places as a planner where it's actually on the ground working on this. Huge amounts lost and a lot of this traffic we have is a consequence of not having a more diverse community in each communities. Uh, so it's kind of double negative. Uh, the solution to it is very hard and it comes down to subsidies usually which has to do with everybody pitching in and offering help to people who can't afford to live in high-priced areas. Subsidies of some kind, town, state, county, federal. Um, you can build a little bit of subsidized housing, which East Hampton has tried to do. I don't know the situation in Southampton. Uh, they're trying to build it and provide it and have uh, lotteries to get into and qualifications to get into it, but it's small amounts because it's such an expensive thing to do from the scratch. The only real solution I know of as somebody who knows a little bit about the economics of communities and planning is some kind of subsidy program that's at a scale that makes sense. And also wherever there is any upzoning you are increasing the value of the land, making it harder and harder uh, to do a, affordable housing. And there are kind of gentle ways that you can bring affordable units within a community, but um, it takes a lot of research because some communities have done it, um, but it, 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 more importantly, it takes the real public will to do it. Um, and, and that's, that's tough because Nobody money talks. Thank you so much. This was really wonderful. I know, I know there are others of you who have questions and comments. You can you know, continue on quietly together. Uh, I think one of the takeaways of this, certainly from the film and from everything that you've said on the stage, 
is that the way to affect change is grassroots, bottom up. Uh, which means that if you don't like what's going on in the town and you uh, want to see something happen, run for office, right. agitate, uh, make your voices heard. And, uh, and I think that's what Jane did and that's what we're all doing. And uh, this was a beautiful way to start. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you guys so much.